And thank you so much for inviting us to talk in this seminar. It's really exciting. And also I'm very excited because it's the first time we are presenting as a lab group. And I think I, I'm, re I'm really excited to see how it goes. So my name is Susanna. I'm an assistant professor. And our, our Sound Forest Lab is based in the Nelson Institute, as Ben said, and also in the Department of Forest and Wildlife Ecology at UW-Madison. And we'll talk to you today about how we use soundscapes in conservation of tropical forests and beyond, and as Zecher will tell us about California. And I want to start by showing you a video of a tropical forest in Gabon. And as you'll see it in a minute emerging from the clouds, I want you to focus on how many different tree species can you see and think about the structure of the forest. So this is a forest that has been selectively logged before, and you can actually probably see a logging gap here on the left. And I hope you can see quite a few different tree species. The structure is still looking really good. And so from from this really high resolution video or imagery, we might conclude that the forest is actually still almost intact. It looks really good. But how good is it for the animals, for the fauna underneath the canopy? And that's one of the main questions that interests me. I want to know, I want to be able to learn about forest, um, forest biodiversity in terms of of how it's doing under different um, conservation strategies and different human disturbances. So I want to play you another short video, but this time also with the sound. This is actually a sound that Ben found in one of our recordings. So Ben, this might be familiar. And you might have guessed that um, it's a sound of a chimpanzee. It sounds like a happy one uh, from, this, from this forest in Gabon. And so even just in a few seconds of the audio, we learn that this habitat is probably good enough for a chimpanzee to be, to be living in. And so this is, this is kind of the the core of us uh, as a lab using soundscapes and bioacoustics to learn about biodiversity underneath the canopy. And, and myself, I'm a forest conservation scientist. And oh, I, I was going to show you also a short video of the chimpanzee and remind you that uh, the soundscapes are not only great to hear the, the big primates and vertebrates, but also we can learn much more from them. We can learn about insects and birds and siblings. And uh, what I was trying to say is that I think it's actually a really good time, possibly the best time ever to be a forest conservation scientist. I think that the global attention on forests is at a record high. Everyone seems to be somehow involved in forest conservation, whether it's NGOs, whether it's governments, even companies, like even Netflix or, or uh, United Airlines, everyone is either planting trees in a billion or trillion tree planting campaign, or people are trying to protect forests from deforestation. And the main reason for that is of course, climate change. So forests are amazing for storing carbon, uh, we all know how important it is to, to preserve all the carbon that's already locked up in them and also do reforestation to sequester more. And so I am really happy about all these nature-based climate solutions that are using forests to, to, to mitigate climate change. However, at the same time, I often worry that if we are doing conservation that's solely focused and driven by carbon, we might often end up with forests like the one on the left, if we can even call it a forest. Um, so monoculture plantations like the, this left picture, they can actually accumulate quite a lot of carbon, but they are definitely a disaster for biodiversity. And this is especially the case in tropical forests, which has as many as half of all terrestrial species. So 
why why do companies and even NGOs why do they solely focus on carbon? I don't think it's necessary that they wouldn't care about biodiversity. I just think it's actually really tricky for them to to stay accountable to measure and to verify and document how much they're contributing to biodiversity conservation. And so that's why our labs, the Sound Forest Lab mission, and one of our main goals is to develop tools that would be easy to use by, uh, <clears throat> by NGOs and companies, and in general do science that will, that will um, help tropical forests be biodiverse and also equitable in the future. So you've already met some of the lab members and you will hear from them um, in a little bit. And I feel that I've been incredibly lucky to have had such an amazing lab and work with scientists from all over the world. So collectively, we work mostly in tropical and subtropical forests, but occasionally branching out into research in the United States. And today's talk's topic is looking at how we can develop tools to monitor tropical forest biodiversity in a cheap and effective way so that we can make better conservation decisions. And I think that most of us here in, in, in this seminar have worked with bioacoustics in some way or another, whether it's marine or freshwater or terrestrial or cicadas. I think that we might follow a similar workflow, right? So we, first of all, have to have some organisms in, in nature or anywhere that makes sounds, and we collect the data. Next, we have to process the data. We have to somehow turn those sounds and soundscapes into some kind of numbers that we can then analyze in an ecological way. And then hopefully in the last step, we can start using those insights to make conservation decisions. And so today's talk will follow the, these, these kinds of steps. First, we will hear from Zagara about how he's making the most of scaling up by acoustics through a quasi-experimental design in Sierra Leone and Liberia. Then we'll hear from Zecher, how he's uh, comparing soundscape indices and machine learning in California. And then Tatiana will tell us about one year of soundscapes and how she has analyzed them in terms of impacts of logging on, um, on biodiversity. And then I will briefly discuss an example of a community conservation initiative in Gabon that has actually already used soundscapes for conservation. So with that, I'll turn it over to Zagra and uh, please take it away. Thank you, Susanna, for the introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. I'll be talking about a case study where I designed field studies to evaluate conservation strategy under a causal inference framework by combining bioacoustics with, uh, with quasi-experimental uh, study design. Conservation for tropical forests, uh, of conservation of tropical forests are crucial to protect bi biodiversity and to combat climate change. Bioacoustic studies are a promising tool to monitor biodiversity and their response to threats and conservation strategies. However, we need to be able to explicitly evaluate the effectiveness of conservation strategies to see if the recovery of biodiversity was a result of the conservation work. That's where the power of quasi-experimental design comes in, where you could reasonably infer a cause, in our case, conservation work, to an effect, say, uh, saving biodiversity. As a case study, we evaluated the biodiversity conservation benefits of GOLA Redless project. REDPLUS stands for Reduced Emission for Deforestation Forest Degradation. It's a carbon finance initiative. Its focus is production of forests with inferred co-benefits to biodiversity and people. However, it doesn't always work that way, particularly in forests threatened from illegal poaching. GOLA REDPLUS initiative was started by a consortium of NGOs along with the government of Sierra Leone at the GOLA Rainforest National Park, uh, shown here as GRNP. The project has been successful for the past 10 years to completely halt any kind of forest loss and degradation within the National Park with noticeable socioeconomic benefits to the communities who are living within the buffer zone. Our question was, has biodiversity benefited due to GOLA Red Plus? In general, Red Plus side would provide financial incentive to protect uh, forests, 
shown here using the blue ice cream. To understand overall causal model, we created a theory of change based on historical timeline that was developed by involving our on-ground partners since the beginning of the research. The blue area shows the PA management, the green area shows the buffer management by working with the local communities, and the yellow area shows the ecological processes that might be affected uh, by these management practices. Our hypothesis was that a combination of uh, alternative livelihood methods within the green area and the effective PA monitoring within the blue area would aid in biodiversity recovery by reducing hunting pressure. We also learned from, uh, from creating this timeline and the theory of change that the Gola Ripless, like many conservation strategies, was not chosen randomly. Therefore, to explicitly show that the biodiversity benefits we saw was a result of the park being managed through Gola Redpless, and this was an added benefit that would not have occurred otherwise, we identified a control site using something called a matching estimators method, which was a PA with very similar biogeoclimatic variables, but did not enjoy the added benefits from Redpless. It is important to note that the national budget for wildlife conservation is so less that production for of forest and wildlife solely depends on red plus strategies. So our bioacoustic response variables were to measure hunting pressure, we used number of gunshots, uh, and to measure faunal diversity, we used the metric of soundscape saturation. Tachi, who will be presenting later, will explain this metric in detail. We chose potential sampling sites that had very similar biogeoclimatic variables with a gradient of predictive variable, which in our case was a forest remoteness. Matching estimators is a technique where observations from a uh, treatment site, in our case, red plus and control site, can either be uh, matched based on their covariates or the probability of treatment, primarily used on observational data that has already been collected. But we wanted to pre-select these sites during the planning phase itself to take full advantage of bioacoustic field studies. We then sampled around 100 of these chosen sampling sites. I want to use this opportunity to also acknowledge all my fantastic research assistants who walked with me hundreds of kilometers and the people of the local community who also allowed me to walk in their land. It was a, it was a surreal moment. Anyway, so... Uh, our matching estimator technique of quasi-experimental design has its own pros and cons. It is perfect to control for selection bias, which is ubiquitous in conservation, where every site has an emotion, emotional story that directly resulted in conservation work, so making it less random. Uh, but it's also very difficult to know and quantify all data, such as land use history, which we term as unobservables here. The paper by Butzik and, and others, it's a very good introduction to quasi experimental design, particularly for ecologists to apply in, uh, in conservation work. For those who are eagerly waiting for a groundbreaking graph showing causality between red plus and you know, biodiversity recovery, I might disappoint you as I'm still analyzing the data. So I'll be showing what we hope to see in a situation where the Gora red plus, you know, situation where the Gora red plus was successful in recovering biodiversity. In the x-axis, we have forest remoteness. In the y-axis, we have gunshots detected. So related to the number of gunshots detected along the forest remoteness within the control site, the Gola Redpless site would have a significantly lower number of gunshots that would decrease along the remoteness gradient. Next, for, for the faunal diversity, in the x-axis, we have um, a forest remoteness again. and the y-axis, we have some saturation. So relative to the soundscape saturation along the forest remoteness within the control site, Gola Redpress site would have significantly higher estimates of soundscape saturation, thus faunal diversity, that would increase along the remoteness gradient. So I want to specify that this significant dis difference we would be observing would be a direct result of Gola Redpress and without by taking into consideration of all the other biases. While bioacoustic is a great method to study biodiversity, uh, comparing our main study site with a control under, under quasi-experimental design, we can uh, take advantage of the true power of bioacoustics 
we can unleash the true power of bioacoustic to actually uh, effectively study virus. Thank you. And now that we have done the you know, back-breaking work of collecting field data, our next speaker, Zakir, will be explaining you more on how you can go about analyzing such data sets, data sets by talking about his own work from uh, Sierra Nevada. Thank you, Sagra, for sharing your research. And uh, hello, everyone. I'm happy also to share my research with you today, which is mainly centered around uh, comparing acoustic indices and bird species richness derived from bird net in the Sierra Nevada, uh, California. The acoustic data can be analyzed in two different ways. The first way is acoustic indices. Uh, today, I believe we have over 60 indices that provide a summary of spectral and temporal information, and they may provide an opportunity to monitor biodiversity um, without the need to identify specific species, for example, by showing the overall daily trend of the soundscape. On the other hand, we have classifiers and convolutional neural networks that focus on, on more on identifying species or species, a specific acoustic event. L listening to every species vocalizing can take a lot of time, uh, as we all know. That's why scientists prefer to vis visualize acoustic through spectrograms. Uh, considering this one minute spectrogram, uh, an acoustic index takes the spectrum of sound and narrow it down to a single value for each minute. Take the acoustic complexity index, for example, it measures the complexity of sound within that minute. Meanwhile, tools like BirdNet classify types of sound, trying to assign them to specific species or a specific acoustic event. Acoustic indices, particularly the acoustic complexity index, have been uh, employed as proxy for biodiversity in numerous studies, often correlated with bird species richness. However, these studies can only do a limited ground truthing. For example, it could be that an acoustic index averaged across a day correlated with species richness from birth point counts coming from certain minutes of subsampled sampled days. This creates a mismatch where both metrics are not following the same temporal scale. Uh, Thanks to this, to the amazing tools such as BirdNet, I utilized BirdNet machine learning algorithm to analyze both bird species and the acoustic complexity on a minute by minute uh, basis. Despite the limitation of BirdNet and the acoustic complexity index, these studies offer valuable insight into the behavior of this matrix on consistent temporal scale. I'm, I'm grateful to uh, Professor Zach Spiris, our collaborators, uh, and also Connor, uh, for sharing a data set that enabled me to analyze acoustic data from 826 uh, acoustic recording units across the Sierra Nevada, California. The sampling data ranged from May to July in the year 2021, and each recorder is recording for 15 hours per day. My analysis focuses on understanding the daily trends of the acoustic complexity index and bird richness inferred from BirdNet, their by variation across different months, and their behavior in both burned and intact forest. The daily trends of normalized values for both acoustic complexity index and, and bird richness showed a degree of similarity, as we can see from this plot, but exhibited significant differences during the down course and evening periods. As illustrated in the graph, which plots normalized values over time, both metrics experienced a peak during the down course. However, the, the rise in bird richness began earlier and sustained for a longer duration in contrast to the ACI peak, which, which was narrower and only lasted for two hours. In the evening, bird richness demonstrated a, st a distant increase, forming a noticeable peak. On the other hand, the ACI showed a continuous decline into 9 p.m. These temporal variations highlight some of the differences in behavior of these two metrics through the day. When it comes to the effect of the uh, of fire, the two graphs, these two graphs show how bird richness and acoustic complexity index change throughout the day in, bo in, in both burned and in, which is in the orange color and intact forest, the green color. On the left, the bird richness graph shows similar patterns in both types of forests. 
However, the richness is higher in intact forest during the day. You can also see the distant peak at dawn and dusk. On the right, the ACI uh, graph mostly follow the same pattern in both intact and burned forest. However, the complexity in burned forest is higher, especially in the evening. Overall, burned forests have a higher acoustic complexity, which is the opposite of bird richness that is higher in intact forest. Both bird richness and the acoustic complexity index showed mostly similar patterns in months May, uh, in, in the months May and June and July. Both metrics reached their highest value in May. Bird richness shows the two distinct peak in down and dusk. But one interesting observation is that both metrics showed a shift in their onset during the down, where it starts earlier in June compared to May and July, and another shift in the dusk where the peak of activity ends later in June compared to May and July. It is also worth noting that July, in, in July during the evening, the acoustic complexity is signif significantly lower compared to uh, June and May. I, I've just got this result and there are a lot of questions uh, to solve what could this unexpected observation and difference are due to. For example, could they be related to, the, uh, to how the sun propagate in the ecosystem? Could they be related to other soundscape elements such as insects, mammals or frogs? Could they be related to the sensitivity of the acoustic complexity index to the abundance? No matter what the reasons are, it is important to consider matching the temporal scale for both metrics to provide accurate ground truthing. It is also important to examine the correlation between indices and our target taxa, as well as their susceptibility to, to geophony. And finally, just as neural networks should be tested on local data sets, the same apply to acoustic indices. Now that we went through the analysis, um, uh, to analyze the acoustic data, it gives the word. I, I will give the word to my colleague Tatiana to talk about the ecological meaning of these indices and what they can tell us about the ecosystem. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Tatiana Maeda. I'm a PhD researcher at the Sound Forest Lab, and I will be talking today about selective logging impacts on biodiversity during the first year uh, post logging in Borneo. And um, selective logging is the most dominant activity in forest. And in Borneo, a global biodiversity hotspot, logging concessions have more than half of the remaining forest, which makes the effect of logging critical to biodiversity conservation. Studies assessing the selective logging impacts on biodiversity are often limited to a spatial sampling, capturing patterns over space but less frequently assessing biodiversity variation over time. Uh, taking advantage of acoustic monitors that can easily capture data over long periods of time, the Zanai collaborators collect the soundscapes of 19 mature forest sites over a year. And I have two main types of, oh, of sites, intact sites in green, sites that are either never logged or was, um, or was less logged more than 25 years prior to the data collection, and logged sites that are intact sites that were logged during the recording period. And I calculated biodiversity measurements in two ways, an acoustic index called soundscape saturation, which is based on the acoustic niche hypothesis. So this hypothesis was elaborated by Bernie Krause and suggested that animals have evolved to partition the acoustic space by communicating at different frequencies and time in order to communicate more efficiently. And based on this, Zuzana collaborators thought that a quick way to predict how many species there are in the sound would be to calculate it how saturated the animal sounds or how saturated with animal sounds the frequency bands are. And we found that the more saturated the sound is, the higher the number of unique animal calls per minute. And this, is co this correlation is robust for three different countries in Asia, including Borneo. And 
So I'm using soundscape saturation as a proxy for species richness of all vocalizing animal groups. And I fitted linear models uh, with logging, altitude, and month as exploratory variables uh, to soundscape saturation for each minute of the day separately. And these are the results of my modeling. Um, on the y on the y axis, I have the soundscape saturation. On the x axis, I have the time of the day. And dots are the parameter estimates for intact forest in green and logged forest in yellow, plotted for each minute of the day. And I found that uh, altitude had a had an effect on few minutes of the day, and then month had an effect on many minutes of the day. And then logging, um, we found that selective logging had mostly negative effects on soundscape saturation during the daytime, especially in the morning and during the dusk chorus and early evening also. And this could indicate a decline in the alpha diversity of diurnal and early night species during the first year post logging. Um, logging had a positive effect on soundscape saturation in few minutes of the day, um, indicated in orange at around 6 a.m. mostly. And however, it looks like instead of an increase of sounds of this bit of increase in soundscape saturation in the dawn chorus, the dawn chorus in the log site might have shifted um, to start and end a bit earlier than in the intact forest. We still don't know why this could happen. One guess would be because of a more open canopy. Animals may sense sunlight earlier, uh, triggering a earlier start of the dome course. But I'm also curious to know what other scientists might think about this. And then in addition to soundscape saturation, we also manually sample a few minutes of um, the two highest peak of, of uh, acoustic activity of the day, which are the dawn and the dusk. And we manually labeled in an intact forest in a logged forest for a year. And this is how a minute at the busiest time of the day looks like in Borneo. And after really months, or maybe four months of listening to the recordings, and classifying all the unique animal sounds that I'm calling sonotypes, I found an average of 14 different unique sounds or sonotypes per minute and a maximum of 34 uh, sonotypes per minute. And, oh, sorry, um, go back a little bit. And I found more than 400 different sonotypes. Most of them are from birds and then insects and then some amphibians and mammals as well. And looking at the dawn chorus in specific, we found that insects had a higher accumulation of different sonotypes or unique calls at the selectivity log site compared to the intact forest. So selectivity log site is also in yellow and intact forest is in green. And this indicates an increase of insect temporal heterogeneity. So over time, there were more accumulation of different insects um, in the logged forest. And during the dusk, the log site had a lower accumulation of bird sonotypes over time compared to the intact forest, suggesting a decrease of bird temporal heterogeneity with selective, selective logging. And then lastly, um, Yes, our soundscape analysis allowed us to see the effect of logging over 24 hours and to analyze temporal changes in composition, a, a pattern that is overlooked in spatial studies. So our results suggest that selective logging over the first year post-logging reduces the species richness of diurnal and early night sound emitting species and changes species composition over time, increasing insect temporal turnover over dawn and reducing bird temporal turnover over dusk. So this is what I had for today. And next, um, Zuzana will talk about a different project, but highlighting the conservation decision and how soundscapes um, analysis helped with that. Thank you. 
Thank you, Tatiana. So for the last part of this talk, I want to move away from fancy, complicated analyses, months of annotations and, uh, and modeling, and going only to back to kind of simple uses of soundscapes, but in, in, a, in this powerful case of community conservation. So at the beginning, I played you the sound of a chimpanzee from this forest that you can see on the right. And this forest is really special. Um, this has actually never been logged before. And it is a forest that's right in the middle under, under this river in this red polygon. So this map shows an area of Gabon close to, close to Makoku. And I think that this particular map is really representative of, of Gabon's forestry landscape. You can see that you can see all of these gray polygons and all of those are selective logging concessions. And Gabon as a country has actually dedicated more than half of all of its land to selective logging, to the timber industry. In green, you can see a national park and Gabon also has quite a few national parks. This red polygon is something new that may be happening in Gabon. It's, a, it's an idea that, uh, that a community called Masaha has had to withdraw a piece of forest from the timber estate. And I was lucky enough, um, together with a graduate student, Tatiana Sachivi, to be visiting this, this red polygon uh, in, the, in the Masaha community during our study on the impacts of selective logging and certification on biodiversity in Gabon. So we're sampling these, uh, these, these timber estates and, and national parks. And as we were camping next to the Masaha community, we were talking with local people and they told us that they have this big problem, that they have, um, they have witnessed how logging is going on in neighboring villages and they really wish for logging not to happen in what they consider their ancestral forest in, in the red. And now I want, to, I want to take a pause. Not all logging companies are, uh, are certified with sustainable certification in, in Gabon. In fact, uh, this company that's neighboring Masa has a pretty bad record and already has had many complaints. So the community has seen what happens when logging proceeds. And uh, they were organized enough that they, they found out that in the Gabonese forest code, there is actually a provision that people can withdraw a piece of forest from the timber estate if there is a substantial reason to do so. And that could be high biodiversity, it could be high carbon value, it could be some kind of biocultural importance. And the Masaya community uh, was super organized. They, they wrote, they hand delivered a letter to the government requesting that their forest be withdrawn. And they also were able to ask scientists such as myself, as well as other teams, to use scientific data to help them prove that their forest is actually really special in terms of biodiversity, as well as in terms of other aspects. And so we, we used the soundscape data that we had collected in Masaha and in other areas of Gabon to be able to analyze uh, the biodiversity in, in the community's forest. We were able to show from the soundscapes that there are numerous uh, endangered species, including the critically endangered gorilla, as well as a lot of bird species that are hard to observe otherwise. And we were able to give a concrete proof, evidence that, that these species occur there and that uh, it's, it's important in terms of conservation. Now, uh, together with collaborators, including Ben, our host today, we are also trying to answer how many of these species might decline in abundance or be even lost when conventional logging happens. Um, and that's an ongoing work. We're also able to create soundscape profile using this metric of soundscape saturation that Tatiana described earlier, which suggests that these never logged forests in Masaha are actually different to even forests that had been recovering after logging for many, many years. So this is something interesting. The community has been able to present to, to, the, to the government and together with other data, and uh, they are also planning to use data from soundscapes 
to monitor and, and adjust their hunting management plans. So Masaha has developed over the last year or so a very specific uh, plan to manage their own hunting and to also monitor if people from outside of their community may be hunting. Hunting is a complex topic in Gabon. It's very common. Uh, it's sometimes legal, sometimes illegal. Um, and it's, it, the, the, the legal provisions can be quite murky. But Masa has really taken the initiative to design their own plan and to decide what is sustainable for them. And they think that soundscapes can help them. So pulling all of these data and results together, it was actually successful because at some point, the government decided that they will actually visit the forest of Masa. This was amazing news. Uh, we'd been waiting for this for, for super long. And the Minister of Forestry and his team were actually really touched and impressed. They, 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 they felt that the forest is, is special. And they did decide that they would help accompany this community to, to protect the forest in the long run. Now, it's not all yet finalized. We're still waiting for the official written document that will declare this area to be, to be a conservation zone. But I think this is really good news. And it is so special because in Gabon, there is not so far a single community-driven uh, conserved or protected area. So this would be the very first one, which is really exciting. If you'd like to learn more about this story, uh, I would suggest uh, reading articles by Ben Evinebine, who is a local journalist in Makoku and Masaha. And um, he's on Twitter. He's written several papers in, in Mongabe and recently in Teralinga. And also you can check out the website of, <clears throat> of a Gabonese NGO called Nadia Gabon, where there are several members from Masa are on, on the board of, of Nadia Gabon. And um, you can learn more about their forest beyond the soundscape story. All right. I'm also very happy and proud to announce that the this proposed protected and conservation area, the community decided to name it Ibola Jabana Damasaha, which means the, <clears throat> the forest reserve for all of the children of Masaha. And they decided to, to host the first Sansky baseline for, for our collaborative Sansky baseline project. So this project, which, uh, which Grace Ingram, who's also in the audience and who's also a lab member, is, is working on with us. Here we're trying to collaborate with many different teams around the globe to collect soundscapes at several sites, but over a full year at intact forest locations. The main use of these data will be to help uh, conservation efforts to monitor if they are successful or not, and also give power to communities or, or whoever needs, such as the community in Masa, to be able to show, okay, we want to prevent loss of biodiversity. This is the data. This is what we're comparing ourselves to. This is only the start of the project. So we definitely welcome more collaborators, more partners from different uh, parts of the world. And with that, I would like to conclude. Um, so we heard to begin with how we could move away from correlation towards causation by using quasi-experimental design and bioacoustics. Then we learned from Zecher that ground truthing should really be done at a matching temporal scale and also matching frequency scale. Then we learned from Tatiana that first time logging and selective logging in general does change the vocalizing fauna. And that is really important to consider also impacts over time. So these impacts may change and accumulate over, over the first year or so after logging. And then, I, and then hopefully I inspired you to learn more about how communities actually can use bioacoustics in any, any type of scientific data to, to, to fuel their own initiatives to protect forests. So overall, I am really hopeful that all of us together um, and, and all of the colleagues involved in bioacoustics that we can help future forests to be more like the one on the right than the one on the left. And that forests can be good, not just for carbon, which is very important, but also good for biodiversity and the people 
will live nearby them. So with that, thank you very much for your attention. And thank you also for all the different funders for the different projects and many collaborators. Um, and we look forward to taking your questions. Well, thank you guys. Thank you all. Um, I think that this will be a really useful presentation for anybody interested in learning about bioacoustics in a more full way in terms of each of these steps um, from experimental design all the way through conservation outcomes. Um, does anybody have any questions or comments about um, any of uh, anything that you saw in the presentation? Yes, yeah, so there's a question in the chat uh, about whether this research is, is published. So actually we decided this time to present mostly ongoing work uh, because we saw that that's the most exciting, the most uh, kind of new stuff. But if you're interested to read some publications by our lab, then I would invite you to go to, to our website. I'll put it in the chat. And that one of the reasons why we decided to present kind of ongoing unpublished work is because I think that this audience is really, really special in the sense that everyone is pretty much involved with bioacoustics. So we also selfishly wanted to pick your brains if you might have any ideas on interpretation and so on. Connor? Great work, everybody. Um, that's It's really fun to see that. Um, it's exciting stuff that you're doing. Um, I have this, this is kind of an open-ended question, but something that struck me is that these indices, you can cal calculate them at such a fine scale, like on a second or second by second or minute by minute basis and break it down by frequency bin. Um, but I think a lot of us think about biodiversity at the scale of months or years, like the species richness of a location we think about that of like, what was it in that season? I mean, I, I'm a, I work in a more seasonal environment where that makes more sense, but still species richness tends to be this more long-term metric. So how, how do you approach that challenge of, of consolidating second by second information to something that matches up with a metric that's usually on a monthly or annual timescale? Zecher, you should you should start the answer and then the rest of the lab can chime in if if anything. Yeah, happens. sure. Hey, hey Connor, thank you for the question and thank you again for all the help you provided for you know my master. And yeah, I, I believe what you said is true. People tend to think about richness on more of like seasonal and maybe like larger time scale. But the main one of the main goals from this research that I done was more of like understanding the behavior of these tools rather than maybe focusing on the um, uh, ecological interpretation of what that mean and whether like it is important to consider richness on a minute scale or something like that. So whether what can what could these differences be in, like explained whether geophony or any other kind of perturbation, whether anything beyond uh, birds when vocalized, maybe insects or something like that. I, I, I believe I still need to further investigate a lot of uh, um, ideas as we already discussed uh, previously, I think. But thank you, Connor, for the question. And I would just add to that, I see both soundscape indices and machine learning and any, any kind of use of bioacoustic data that we should be using to, to estimate biodiversity at whatever scale is um, ecologically meaningful, but we really first need to understand how they work. And 
I think that a lot of the time, including in my own work, sometimes we just use the indices a little bit like almost like a black box. And we don't know, okay, do they really do they really behave the way we think they do? How exactly do they respond if there is a thunder or rain or um, something like that? So I think this detailed understanding then can build our understanding of how to properly use them uh, at the appropriate scale. I just wanted to add that um, looking at dawn and dusk and labeling the different sonotypes, I found that there's very little overlap between the sonotypes that I found over dawn and dusk, suggesting that there are different communities, assemblages, uh, vocalizing at, at these different times of the day. So one way also, instead of looking so if we think that different times of the day may have different community assemblages, maybe looking at only one period of, uh, of the day, for example, as dawn, and then looking at that over time instead of 24 hours over time could be maybe a simpler way of um, trying to see temporal changes. Uh, Klaus? Would you like to say your question? Yes, uh, thank you. That was a, a great presentation or four presentations, sort of mind boggling, of course. And uh, I absolutely agree uh, uh, with you what you said in the beginning that um, it's a great time for forest conservation. Um, unfortunately, it's also a great time for forest destruction. As you know, not everybody wants to plant trees. Uh, and unfortunately, as you can see in Borneo, it's not only selective logging, it's a, a total destruction and substitution of landscape from a forest to a plantation, what we have never thought of 30, 40 years ago. Now, 30, 40 years ago, selective logging was a big topic. And then FEC came in, Forest Stewardship Council, which was supposed to, to certify sustainable, uh, sustainable extraction of timber. Uh, so my question goes into selective logging. Um, how selective is the logging? The pictures I've seen didn't look very selective. I remember discussions on selective logging uh, where uh, in, uh, Gunnar Mool suggested to extract single trees by helicopter to avoid uh, forest roads. And, um, uh, but as you have seen, uh, uh, roads are the first problem which you have uh, with selective logging. And then the size of the logging uh, um, enterprise is, is decisive. So, uh, my question is, how do you quantify selective logging? And do you have any contacts with Forest Stewardship Council? Thank you, Klaus. Those are really important points. Um, and I would say, first of all, um, the selective logging that we that we discussed in the presentation were quite different. So for example, in, in Borneo in Indonesia, the selective logging intensities can go up to even over like 30, 50 cubic meters per hectare, which could be 10 or more trees per hectare, which is a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas the ones in Gabon are much lower. So mm -hmm. there, um, for example, you could have as few as one or even less trees extracted per hectare. So there, in Gabon, for example, the bigger impacts that um, that logging might have is just through the roads, as you mentioned, and also through bringing in people, uh, building new infrastructures, maybe doing a little more hunting. Now, the the FSC is is has been trying to improve the, the sustainability and the quality of selective logging for the last, yeah, since 1992. And I think that the one, uh, the one exciting development that FSC has recently been getting more into is they really are trying to put biodiversity into their assessments. So at the COP15 um, in of conventional 
what is it, Convention on Biodiversity, the UN Conference on Biodiversity, FSC announced that they will finally try to move towards including biodiversity assessments directly in the audits. And uh, this is not something that they have done until now. Until now, uh, different countries and different companies would be following a kind of ad hoc basis to measure their biodiversity impacts. And I think that eventually, if we do have some kind of uniform way, or at least some, some basic obligations to measure biodiversity, this could really be helpful. And this is where bioacoustics, as well as other conservation technologies, might be super, super useful. I think the biggest problem with FSC is that they have uh, relatively less presence in tropical forests. So for example, in Gabon, only three out of the hundreds concessions are FSC certified. So I think the bigger issue is how do we reach the conventional logging, the maybe less well-organized um, concessions. Thank you. Thank you. Just one remark to Tatiana, um, and I think your idea about the light is is correct. I, I will try to get in touch with you. And uh, yeah, thank you. Please, I read so many of your papers uh, in Borneo and Insight, so I would love to connect with you. Yeah, thank you. There's I see Sorry, go on, Ben. I see Fernando has a question about um, any idea of how local people perceive the soundscape in areas where you are working. Mm -hmm. I think, um, yeah, anyone of us can, can answer. I will start by a brief answer. I think that um, I have learned so much more about soundscapes from, from camping with people in Gabon than from studying the spectrograms because they could really pick out immediately, okay, not only which animal is approaching, but whether it's stressed, whether it's lonely, whether whether it should or shouldn't be there. So I think definitely, at least in Gabon, people are very aware and use soundscapes to orient in the environment. Um, but I am sure that this is very different in, in all of our study sites. So I don't know, Zagora, Tati, and Zecher, if you would like to add. Yeah, I mean, um, as Zuzana said, I think they have a very, very difficult, uh, sorry, different perspective towards soundscapes and they use it on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, while they're going in the, in the forest, while you know, uh, even if they're going out hunting or fishing, or walking back from the from collecting something from the from NTFPs from the forest, but it was such a different twist when I said that I was recording them, <clears throat> and that just completely shifted the perspective towards can can they record like us walking or talking or uh, running around and um, you know so and when we told this to kids, I think their complete perspective was completely changed that they want to go around and sing around it. So, but uh, but otherwise, I think I think there are two different perspectives. You know, innately they use soundscapes. I think uh, uh, for day to day perspective. But as soon as you say that you are recording it, just mind blown that oh, can I hear that bird or what bird is that or what animal is that? And I think for example, tigers. You know, like they could not. They you know they were uh, you know this is a small antelope species that many of you might be familiar with uh, with African tropical species. So they were able to like. Say okay, this is this type of species. This is that type of species. But they were interested to see whether how the recording was in my soundscapes. Yeah. And I'll just add the important note that, like, just as all of us here in Madison, Wisconsin, have different relationship to sounds and soundscapes. I think everyone in the village of Masa has also a different relationship to the forest and soundscapes. And I think that's that's important to keep in mind that there, even though I talk about the community as one community, it's composed of many different interesting people. Sakar? Yeah, I believe I have a question from Santiago. 
Um, Santiago asked, when calculating richness with BirdNet, did you calibrate the confidence score by species or did you use the same values for all? I, I used uh, thresholds that Connor was kind enough to provide. And the thresholds are for 101 species in the Sierra Nevada uh, in California. And I used the cutoff of 85%, which is the, the lowest cutoff that allows for more species to you know uh, count for. And since I'm, I was focusing more on the richness, rather a single species study. Thank you for the question, San Diego. So if anybody has a forest data set, um, would it be helpful or the right way to just send an email to the Sound Forest Lab or who should they contact if they're yes. interested in? reaching out about the, the soundscape baseline project. Thanks for thanks for bringing that up. Yes, the best way if you like to collaborate or if you know partners in, in other countries that might is uh, to email me and Grace and uh, or actually anyone, it will get to get to us eventually. And we would love to talk. Okay, awesome. Um, Thank you all so much again. It's really an inspiring team. And um, I hope that you do this presentation again in different contexts, just because it's quite powerful. Um, and so this was the Soundscapes approach to learning about um, forest biodiversity. And over the next few sessions, we're going to complement this by taking a deep dive on machine learning approaches, which are commonly used to um, detect and classify the sounds of you know, individual species or sounds of interest. And so next week, or in two weeks, we'll be hearing from a team from Colombia, um, Juan Sebastián Cañas, Maria Paula Toro, and Juan, Juan Sebastián Ojua. And they'll talk um, broadly about machine learning for tropical acoustic monitoring, both the challenges and then the opportunities. And then we're doing something that is atypical for bioacoustics. talks. We're, we're going to have a hands-on training session where we will learn about a new tool or a new model of an existing tool, the BirdNet Analyzer GUI, which you can use um, to pretty easily train your own machine learning classifier. And so you can retrain BirdNet to find sounds that you are interested in, whether it's birds, bats, whales, um, really anything. Um, and so we're going to be meeting and having two sessions on that, I believe, in a, in a month's time and then in six weeks. And so we'll send more information about these training sessions. We'll have some um, exercises that we can do and help everybody install and get acquainted with this tool. Um, and so that will be an atypical, but I, I think really um, fun and useful um, couple of sessions. So we'll, we'll send some more inform information about that shortly. And yeah, thanks to everybody for, for coming in and we'll see you soon. Thanks again to the Sound Forest Lab. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Ben. All right, bye. Good to see you guys.